Today, I have the pleasure to have my friend back to the show, Dr. Natalie Stenhauer, and we're going to talk about the newest report from BIP about the annual colony losses. Natalie, welcome back to the show. Thank you for coming. Thank you. No, it's a pleasure to, to always talk with you. It's always a pleasure. So, BIP is going to release the new report, and I, I was wondering if you can go to those graphics and try to make it easier for the beekeeper to understand what's going on over there and get your thoughts about, you know, this whole progression. So, so many years collecting data, where, where are the trends? What's going on? So let's have a, a half an hour discussion about that. Let me put the graphic here so we can, how oh, I put this, here we go. So what we're looking at. All right. So, yeah, every year in April, um, BIP organizes this um, survey, which we call the Colony Loss and Management Survey. Um, so it's an online questionnaire. It is retrospective, which means that, you know, it's April of this year and we ask beekeepers to remember, you know, what happened in their operation in the calendar year before. So from April 2022 to April 2023. Um, and so it's really... Um, the, the focus of the survey is, the objective is twofold. One is to try to document this mortality rate of colonies, right? What we call the loss rate, uh, which is how frequently do colonies uh, either, you know, collapse or um, uh, need to be replaced. Um, we, inc we, we incorporate into that loss rates combinations of colonies, right? So if you have two colonies, you combine them into one that results in a mathematical loss of one colony, right? So all of that is taken into account. And we're trying to estimate what is this rate uh, so that we can follow that year to year. And so we did that in April again this year. Um, 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 and so the, that's the, um, the number one objective of the survey. And we've been doing it since 2008. The second objective of the survey is to try to relate that loss rates with other factors, try right? to find uh, protective factors or risk factors, so things that aggravate or reduce the risk of, of this loss rates, right? So we ask beekeepers to, to give us their colony numbers so we can calculate their loss rates. And then we also ask them, what have you done last year? And we ask all questions under the sun from like, you know, um, uh, we used to ask everything at once. So uh, beekeepers had to answer us um, questions like, you know, the feeding practice that they use, the, the requeening practices, treatment practices, their monitoring efforts. And now we're trying to make it a little bit easier on beekeepers. And we ask, you know, one, uh, we go into the depth of one topic every year. And then we ask only like very high level questions for the rest of the topics to be able to maintain the questions year to year, but kind of simplify the survey and really going in depth on one topic every year in, in rotation. Um, so that's the, that's the two objective of the survey. So here on this figure, um, you can see, and I don't know if you can, yeah, you can see my... Uh, well, before we dive into this, I, I think I just want to remind the beekeepers how important that is. You know, it, it takes time. It is a lot of work. I, I got a lot of people talking to me, especially about surveys. People don't like surveys, but please keep in mind that all these efforts are super important because after all this work, the BIP can come and do those calculations. You can get very interesting data that can be very useful for you, for your operation, and how can you do a little tricks in your operation and perhaps increase your productivity and, and, and perhaps you know, improve things in your operation. So for that, thank you for participating in the survey and all your efforts to to help BIP to, to do their job. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good point. I, we can't thank a participant enough. Uh, and, and we know that this, this feels very repetitive, right? Because we, we ask people to participate in the survey year after year, but it's really in the long term that this data becomes really useful. Uh, first, because we can try to find trends and so we can really document the situation and see if there are certain groups of beekeeper for which things are getting worse or better or, you know, lack of progress is also something that is important to document. Um, and, and yeah, so we are, uh, uh, and this is something that we have been struggling with year after year is survey fatigue. Um, so that's why we're trying to make the survey easier to take um, and we're relying so much on, word, on you know, 
word of mouth every year to to get beekeepers to participate. And we thank all of the collaborators that are sharing the words for us, all of the beekeepers that take the survey and then share the word. So yeah, we can thank all of you and us. Good. So what do we get? So what did what we get? We <laughs> so, okay, here on this figure, uh, what we see um, is on the top here is all respondents uh, together. Uh, and then here on the bottom is respondents, but split by uh, operation type, right? So loosely, uh, we separate the beekeeping industry into three types of beekeeper, and that's depending on the number of colonies that they manage. And the definition that we use uh, is we look at numbers of colonies owned on October 1st, and we group them if, it, if they are keeping up to 50 colonies, they're considered backyard beekeeper. Between 50 and 500 is sideliners and above 500 is commercial beekeepers. So that's kind of like our own in-house definition. Uh, and that allow us to split beekeepers um, uh, into those three groups. Um, and of course, we also know that the beekeeping industry um, is really characterized by having uh, a few commercial beekeepers, right? They really represent only a fraction of the beekeepers themselves, maybe less than 2%, but they own the vast majority of the colonies in the country. So usually we say less than 2% of the beekeeper, but about 90% of the colonies. Um, and so on this figure here, we see um, the the dot itself represents our estimates of that, that percent of loss, right? The percent of colonies that need to be replaced that disappeared at one point or the other uh, during the, the season or the year. In red, you have the calendar year from April to April. In blue is what we consider the winter, and we define that between October and April 1st as a simplification, um, knowing that we do have some flexibility and we usually recommend beekeepers to give us the number before their splits in the, in the spring. Um, and then in summer, uh, which is basically April 1st to October 1st, that other like active season typically for, for the U.S. Um, and um, yeah, I guess there is a lot of things that we can go over here. Um, but so you have this, this dot represents the estimate of that turnover. And then this interval, which is kind of like the shaded area from year to year, is what we call the confidence interval. So it's a mathematical concept that really just shows how how certain we are of our estimates. Um, so it is um, uh, a combination of the number of respondents and the variation from respondent to respondent, right? So if you ask 10 people and they all give you the same answers, um, um, you, you're going to have a certain amount of confidence because there is not a lot of variability, but it's also a low sample size. But then if you ask a thousand person and they ask and they give you the same answer, you're way more confident, right? And then the other way around is if you ask a thousand person, but they all give you very, very different answers, that's also an another reason why you would have less confidence. So it's both, both the, the, the variability between respondent and the number of respondent that is integrated into this, this concept of, uh, of confidence interval. So just one second. So if it's too spread, too broad, that means less confidence? That's it's correct. That basically close to okay. the, the dot means more confident. So when you have, for example, give me one that is low confidence and one. Yeah, so we, you can definitely directly see how we are more confident about our backyard estimates than about our commercial estimates. Uh, so the, the range of, of the estimates that we have for commercial is typically wider. And that's both because um, you know, there, there might be more variability between respondent, between one commercial beekeepers and the yes, but also there is just less, um, we have less sample size in commercial beekeepers. There is just less commercial beekeepers than there is backyard beekeepers in the U.S. Um, even though we estimate that um, uh, our survey um, usually reach about 10% of the colonies in the country, uh, according, you know, we, we estimate the number of colonies in our survey compared to uh, the estimate from the USDA honey report. And so we can say, you know, if the USDA estimate the number of honey producing colonies every year uh, to a certain amount, which is about 2.7 million colonies, we actually in our survey reach about 10% of that. And it varies from year to year, but that's that we've been pretty consistent on that every year. Um, uh, and so we also know that the proportion from like backyard to commercial 
um, according to uh, some data that we received from the the USDA census, we're also pretty close in that in that proportion. In that um, we have more backyard than commercial, but that's also what is expected from the population. So we're pretty confident we have a good representation of both. But so because of that, we have more sample size in backyard than commercial. Therefore, you know we can give more precise estimate as to as to what is the actual average loss in backyard population because we have so much more respondent in the backyard population. So that's an, that's one of the difference between why the confidence interval are so much more narrow in the backyard than the commercial pool. Okay, so now I got it. So what, what happened in 2023? Did we lose more, less? Mm -hmm. There's a trend? So what happened? All right. So, so here is why. Uh, here is where uh, we get into the detail. So, uh, on the annual level, you can see here the 2023 at the at the population, the U.S. population level. Uh, this is one of the of the bad years, right? Uh, and at annually, so this this point here, there was only one year before that was worse than than this year. If we just look at the April to April, you know, uh, replacement rate of colonies. Uh, and last year we had a, a pretty good year in terms of annual loss. So it really represents this that the, this year on average beekeepers struggled more to keep their colonies alive for the for the for the calendar year than than the year before. Uh, and of course, if we try to split that on and trying to understand when did the loss occur, uh, it most colonies were lost over the winter compared to summer, um, but uh, which is. Typically, what you would expect, um, you know, if you ask beekeepers, what is the, the season in which you experience most of the losses in our in our understanding of just the biology and just the, the, you know, summer is supposed to be a season where colonies grow and thrive. And then winter is supposed to be that like narrow point where weak colonies will 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 collapse and, and will have uh, issues that, you know, maybe have accumulated throughout the year. But that's when you actually observe the dead out. Right. And so. Uh, this year is it was pretty typical in that in that most of the colonies were lost in the winter rather than the summer, uh, and that's very different from last year, for example, which was very surprising in that summer and winter had very similar level of losses. So we were last year we were losing colonies throughout the year, with right. no clear seasonal pattern, and this year was a little more uh, considered to what what the norm is. There is so no reason for that that you you, you guys try to talk with people and find out what what happened that year? Um, so we have a little bit of, of um, understanding uh, if we go more into uh, what's happening by operation type, but getting to the causes of loss is, is always uh, a little bit difficult. And we, we try to, we attempt that, and I can talk about that in a minute with my second slide, uh, but I will also give you like, because I guess that's that's my name as a PhD doc <laughs> as a doctor, and I'm always like, but there are but, some, yeah, 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 yeah. there is some complication uh, as to what we can tell. So I guess I'll I'll give some some of the, those restrictions too. Um, but so what was interesting last year, if we if we divide up between backyard and commercial, um, and sign line are always a little bit in between, um, we can actually see some very different trends. Um, so. So if you look, for example, um, the, the, the annual loss for backyard beekeeper uh, uh, is, is, you know, again, one of the highest levels uh, compared to their historic levels. But it really seems that uh, when, you, when you look at summer versus winter, the season that, that uh, seemed to have been more um, problematic for backyard beekeeper seems to be the summer, right? So their winter loss was actually quite on par with previous years, their summer loss was again one of the highest year, and there seems to have been a trend over time where, uh, for backyard beekeeper, we noticed that more and more uh, backyard beekeepers are reporting losses over the summer. Hmm. Uh, so the last four years have been the the last highest years in in summer loss over you know or, uh, since we started recording summer losses. Um, so it seems really that backyard beekeepers have high have had high loss last year, mostly because of a high level of, of losses over the summer, which is this April to October active season. Um, and on the up of it, if you look at commercial beekeepers, uh, and that's a little harder to, to see here, but uh, it actually seemed that 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 this year winter is really what uh, caused a lot of trouble for commercial beekeepers. So summer loss seemed to have been on par here in, in yellow 
But um, blue here, you can see the, the winter loss is one of the highest level of loss and definitely higher than what we had in the last couple of years. The last time we've had such high level of losses over the winter for commercial beekeepers uh, was here in 2018-19. So, and that actually corresponds to uh, kind of what we have overheard uh, in the field. So it's always very hard um, you know, when we when we hear about anecdotal reports, we hear our beekeepers saying how oh, this year, you know, I've been struggling um, in, at this point, at this point or another. It's always uh, hard to, you know, to to know if the data is going to confirm that. But it seems like we have we have uh, heard a lot from from commercial beekeepers this year uh, in the almonds in particular that that the, the, they were experiencing higher issues. Uh, and it seems that ha that has been confirmed in our survey that this year winter winter losses over the winter from October to split season uh, was higher than usual. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, when, when I look at those graphs, it's always, you know, the first thing as a beekeeper, I, I always come to my mind, what happened, right? Is it, it, and it's, that's the thing that I'm struggling to explain to beekeepers sometimes is that it's not an easy thing to get on surveys like that a, a definitive cause for for a pattern you know right there are there are so many variables and so many different the op kind of operation and people that contribute to this kind of graph that well, i think the a, a good thing for the beekeeper to 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 see those things is to come back and do some kind of remind himself what happened and trying to identify things in his operation that could explain something like that and that could be useful for them to to increase the chances to find what what the potential causes were instead right. of be guessing That's yeah and, and really the those type of long-term trend like those types of long-term data sets really can help us in in two aspects as you said the understanding of a trend is there a trend is thing are things getting worse are things getting better or or, or not uh, and also then um, um, trying to understand why and what could have been at the at the cause of those change. So in terms of trends, uh, you know, when we look at the data, there is not a lot of, of uh, evidence that things are getting significantly worse, except for maybe uh, summer losses for backyard beekeepers, which which have this 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 uptrends. Um, like, but for 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 the rest of the groups and the season, it really just seems to be more random, right? We have worse year, we have slightly better years. Overall, we're still very much higher than what beekeepers tell us they find acceptable. So we actually uh, historically have been asking beekeepers, what do you think is an acceptable level of loss over the winter? We started that in 2008 and we've continued to ask that question ever since. And it's really interesting um, that we actually can see that, uh, you know, they started by telling, you know, in 2008, 2009, oh, 12% is acceptable. Then they went to 15. Then now we're actually closer to 20% of what they consider acceptable over the winter. And so you can see that with with uh, average rates of like 30 or more, we are definitely higher than what beekeepers consider acceptable. Uh, but it it also doesn't you know it doesn't go significantly worse from year to year. There are some good years in the mix, uh, even though what we consider good year is still higher than what beekeepers consider acceptable. Yeah. So I guess we have to to see what we what we consider uh, a normal rate of loss. Um, so, yeah. but. If you want to go into the cause of loss, we actually ask our beekeeper um, to report the, the actual phrasing is what was the most prominent cause of colony loss, in your opinion, um, in your colonies over you know, the summer and the winter. We ask for now both season. Um, and we got those data for uh, 2023. So bear with me because I know I, I love visualization and graphs. And then I, I know a lot of beekeepers tell me uh, they're getting fatigued by all my graphs, so I'll try to I'll, I'll try to 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 follow uh, to explain here the, the visualization. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it bigger for us. Let me take us out of the equation here. Just once. Uh, here we go. All right. So basically, what you can see here is the proportion of beekeeper that selected one answer in in the question: What was the most prominent cause of loss in your operation? So in in orange, you can see the summer. And in, in blue, you can see the, the winter. So every time again, this is the proportion of beekeeper that selected one answer. So the arrow here shows you that, that, that proportion. And then the, the, this range here basically is the same as, as the previous graph. It shows us 
how confident we are of that estimate and the way we get to that data is is actually a, a bootstrap analysis. Um, but basically, it's just how how confident we are. Our you know if we if we if we we we, we take our data and then we mathematically say we're going to take you know a thousand resub sample at random of that data and and see how frequently we get one answer or the other. And that gives us an idea of that variability in our, in our respondents. Um, and so that's how we get those confidence intervals. So again, we are more confident for backyard beekeepers because there is so many more backyard beekeepers. And so the, the replication, the, the sample size, the number of respondents is bigger in backyard beekeepers. Uh, but still, we can still see very clearly like ranks. So we can see like the, the, the top one, right? What was the most often reported cause of, of colony loss by season? So you can see that, for example, if we look first at winter in blue, Varroa was the number one cause of loss reported for backyard beekeeper at about, you know, 38% of respondents. Respondent Varroa was a prominent cause of loss. Sideliner, again, Varroa is the number one cause of loss reported over the winter with more than 60% of sideliners said Varroa was an issue. And commercial, again, Varroa was number one, uh, again, at like, you know, 65% or more. Uh, of commercial beekeepers identifying Varroa as the most prominent cause of colony loss in their operation. And then, so, you know, second option was weather for backyard and then both, you know, queen issues and starvation uh, for sideliners and here queen, queen issues and weather for commercial beekeepers. So it really shows us that if if we if we ask you know what what keeps beekeepers up at night, what are the issues that they're worried about, it's Varroa, Queen issues and adverse weather events, and that's where they they attribute most of the colonies' issues um, and most of the loss of the colonies in their operations. Um, I think I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a personal question, and I always bring this up in this channel. People always asking about these things, and I always like to touch base on that because I have I have the issues with pesticides, as everybody knows. And I, I'm wondering how people here quantify pesticide loss? It's just be kill and then it's considered a pesticide thing? Or there is any way to put in the account, you know, sublethal effects of pesticides that make them more susceptible to everything else that is there? Right. So the way we ask the question is, I can actually even show the question if you give me a second to find it. Take your time because I, I'm convinced pesticides make much more damage than what we know, uh, or mm -hmm. we are able to quantify or have funding to quantify. I'm always going to bring this topic here in my channel. So if, you, if you've taken the survey online, this is the PDF preview. And here is the two questions, right? Yeah. What factors do you think were the most prominent cause of colony deaths in your operation in summer or winter? And here is all the options um, um, for, for the multiple choice. And pe beekeepers also have the choice to enter something uh, open worded, and then we recategorize those uh, in the existing um, categories, if that makes sense, or we have then we add extra categories um, if, if they're not, you know, if they cannot be merged with, with, with previous. So I want to say first, um, so that in the visualization that showed you before, there is less groups, because in order to simplify the visualization, we decided to focus on all of the entries that had at uh, a minimum of 10% response rates. So basically any option that was chosen by 10% uh, or more of any group, either backyard or sideline or commercial, is in this visualization. So if, if, if one option was not chosen by at least 10% in any group, um, then we, we simplified it from the visualization just, just um, yeah. to try to keep things a little cleaner. But so you can see in the option, we actually have uh, pesticides divided between non-apicultural pesticides and apicultural treatments. Um, right. So that's the, the way that we can separate both. And so uh, non-apicultural pesticide is the one that made the figure and apicultural treatment did not meet. So less than 10% of beekeepers uh, in any of the group chose that as an option. So that gives us already an idea that here when you see that you know, uh, here is probably close to 5%. It seems to be a little more prevalent in the in the summer than the winter for backyard beekeepers. Again, here for sideliners, maybe 10% uh, in the summer. of 10% uh, of sideliner beekeeper report this as a cause of colony loss in the summer compared to winter. And here in commercial beekeepers, we actually have uh, 
close maybe to 30% of commercial beekeepers report uh, non-apicultural pesticides as a cause of colony loss in their operation in the summer and a little less in the winter. And uh, and then again, to answer your question about is this bee kill, is this subletal effect? Um, it's very hard for us to know because we don't have a documentation of all of the causes of loss. It's really, you know, the interpretation of this question, right? So is yeah. it considered a prominent cause of colony loss um, by beekeepers? So this is not us actually saying this is the amount of colonies that were dead because of this one cause or the other. Yeah. This is for us a way to estimate the perception of beekeepers as to the different issues. And so we can use this to to see how the perception of an issue has changed over time. And one of the things that we have noticed over time is how Varroa uh, has al always been a concern for commercial beekeepers. So even if you go back 10, ye 10 years ago, when we first started a survey, Varroa was the number one cause of, of colony loss uh, cited by commercial beekeepers. And we can see how that actually climbed to first place for backyard beekeepers over the years. So we have seen like this increase of the perception of the issue in backyard beekeepers year to year, which is very interesting. Um, but so that's one limitation of this data. It, has, it is really um, more than a, a representation of the perception of the issues by beekeepers than a clear, you know, attributable yeah, cause yeah, of death. Like we don't, we, yeah, it's not, we don't have a death certificate for every colony loss and it's yeah. most all of, obviously always be the expertise and the, um, the know of the beekeepers. Um, yeah. Perhaps I need to explain myself here. Yeah. Because it, it is a problem for scientists to real evaluate the problems with pesticides we can't, because we can't measure. It's easier for a beekeeper to see is a varroa thing because they can see the varroa, they can see the things there. But the effect of pesticides, we, we don't have a way easy for the beekeeper to evaluate that the subliteral effect is making the whole bees weaker and then varroa or everything else come in place and do finalize the job killing the thing mm -hmm. and then they're going to get the title as the killer but potentially there is other guys helping in the right. process so that's my my main concern is something we don't have much ways to quantify however there are videos coming about that stay tuned stay tuned that's exciting. Um, yeah, and you're right. And, uh, and that is one of the complications of, of estimating, you know, um, how much of a factor has contributed to loss because most of the time when a colony uh, dies, it's, you know, you usually say it's a death by a thousand cuts, right? And so we might be identifying the last cut that really uh, killed the colony, um, but there might have been, you know, definitely more than one factor involved um, over the year of, you know, over the factor. I like to compare this with HIV. In the past, there is a lot of people dying with flu and nobody couldn't quantify what it was, but was HIV depleting the immune system of the person and then something else coming and getting in and killing and nobody knew was a different virus or a different problem. Whoever finished the job got the title, but it's not the main cause. And I'm not sure how, how much the pesticides are contributing True. to this whole thing. For so, sure. So one one way that we use this data is that we can actually uh, very, very concretely with this data say, okay, here are the issues that are, you know, uh, keeping up, keeping the beekeepers up at night. This is the issues they care about. Yeah. Therefore, we need to invest more research into those questions. So um, we do the, the way that we use this data is both to see yeah, how has the, the perception of an issue changed over time, but also justify, uh, you know, investing into que research questions related to those topics because those are the topics that beekeepers want to know answers about. So what happened here? So the... There is one trend that I observe from my knowledge, so you correct me if I'm wrong. So backyard beekeepers already start to see the varroa is a, is, a, is a bigger problem than they thought before, at least in their ways to measure and do interpretations, correct? Because the, last, uh, the other years in the past, I remember there was varroa was not the number one for them. Mm -hmm. That's correct. So I don't have a visualization of that over time, um, yeah. but... Here you have the 2023 results. And uh, from memory, you are correct that, you know, if we were asking that 10 years ago, Varroa was, was definitely lower in percentage and in rank. So that is one of the trends we've noticed over the years. So what else we have here? Let me see. So starvation is not a problem for commercial guys. I mean, very little said. Right. 
And it's actually, yeah, n uh, not even mentioned in the summer losses, at least yeah. that by by more than 10%. Uh, no, it, it would have been there if because it was here for the for the other group. So it's not mentioned by commercial pers uh, be uh, beekeepers in the summer at all. And it is mentioned by maybe 10% of commercial beekeepers in the winter. Um, uh, and if you look at that, it's only, you know, 20-ish percent for backyard beekeepers. It's just that an another level, another just general thing that you can notice is how consensus is really different, right? Commercial beekeepers, there is a higher consensus that, you know, 65 or more beekeeper percent of the beekeepers say, you know, uh, varroa is among their most prominent cause of dust. If you look at backyard beekeepers, they are really more spread out, right? So the majority of beekeepers, like not, if you look at which answer has, has uh, the consensus of 50% or more of backyard beekeepers, we, we don't find any, right? So they're more dispersed between the different options. So that's another general observation. Beekeep backyard beekeepers are more likely to disagree with one another about what is the most prominent cause of loss compares to side diner or commercial beekeepers. For people at home that doesn't know what DK is. Oh, that's don't know. Thank you for thank you for asking. So if I go back really quickly to the list, uh, we obviously we try to to keep the the, the legend small smaller. But so uh, I don't know is is uh, is one of the options. Uh, for this graph, and so uh, this is basically representing uncertainty, right, from the beekeepers about about what was causing issues in their colonies. Twenty percent of the commercial guys don't know what happened. Interesting. In both winter and summer. Right, and maybe twenty percent and ten percent for backyard and beekeepers. Backyard beekeepers and sideliners. I guess very little. Five, very little. They, know, they they are. Not they know they, they they're more sure about whatever is going on in front of them because remember it's about their perception, right? Yeah, that's correct. And uh, and of course, I I um, we would have to go back to see oh was that specific to this year? Um, uh, is that gen generally true in, in general? Yeah. Um, um, I know that a lot of beekeepers this year, and and that is actually something that uh, I am very curious to compare this weather here in 2023 with previous years and that is something that we're going to do for our peer review article that we're going to prepare over the summer and try to submit later this year is to see how that compares with previous years and uh and see because we have overheard anecdotally that a lot more commercial beekeepers uh, blamed adverse weather conditions uh, over the winter. Um, and so we want to know if, if 2023 was indeed a year where weather, uh, adverse weather was higher and hi more highly cited than in the past. It is an interesting subject because when you look at the backyard, you see the trend. You know, for people that doesn't move their colonies, apparently the summer is getting some problem for them in the backyard of maybe mm -hmm. climate change going on here that we can see a trend. I don't know. It's going to be, I'm looking forward to read the reports that you guys going to come from the, the publication. When, when is coming? Oh, so we are uh, working on the publication over the summer. And but you know how, you know, submitting peer review publication is always kind of like a, a long runner, <laughs> a long um, race, right? So we have to, uh, uh, submit it probably later this year, and then uh, whenever we get reviews back, we'll we'll try to submit to to submit the final peer review as as soon as we can. It usually takes us a calendar year, to be honest. Okay. So we can actually share that um, we we just had recently the most recent paper, um, which actually, if you give me a second, I can I can share too. In the meanwhile, I want to let you people know at home that if you have any questions about those graphs, leave a comment in the comment section below. You know, myself and the BEEP team is going to be looking at those questions and we're going to be working on ways to answer those for you with direct reply or make or going to make a video specific by each question. So please don't be shy to let us know what you think. Today, I wanted to share that um, we just recently um, uh, uh, got the, the the publication accepted in uh, the Journal of Apicultural Research, where you can find the results for three years. Uh, Selena Bruckner at Auburn University uh, pulled a lot of effort to to summarize the results of, of three years in, a, in at the same time, um, uh, including 2019-20. The last two years, so 2021 and 21 2022 uh, is uh, a paper that is currently in preparation. We are in the review stage, and that will be a, pa a paper led by Dan Orell, also from Auburn University. So uh, that will also hopefully be released pretty soon. Very nice. So more more content for me. I'll I'll dive in. Yeah, fun. Natalie, where what else we have here for for beekeepers at home? Um. So 
I guess one, a couple of things that are important for the interpretation are here. Um, so as we say, you know, the, the loss rates is really not an estimation of uh, population loss, right? We're not talking about the number of colonies in the country declining. We actually have data on that from an independent survey, which is led by USDA NAST, the uh, Agricultural, National Agricultural Statistics Services. Uh, and so from, from very different surveys, they do the honey report, they do the census of agriculture. We know that uh, definitely if you look at this timeline, right, from 2008 to now, um, the population in the United States, the number of honeybee colonies had been relatively stable at about 2.7, 2.6 to 2.7 million colonies. And there are fluctuations from year to year. Um, but so when we're saying there is a 30% a winter loss and a 40% annual loss, we're not saying that the number of colonies is declining because this is really a mortality rate. And thankfully, there is the equivalent of a natality rate as well to compensate, right? So beekeepers are making new colonies, constantly making splits um, and, and, and keeping that, that number, uh, that population number relatively stable. But really the problem here is that um, because we have this high turnover rate of colonies, right? Um, that represents a lot of effort for beekeepers to replace their colonies to maintain that population stable. So really when you see a 40% turnaround, what you really should see behind that is the fact that, um, you know, backyard beekeepers um, that have to replace 40% of their colonies on average, and obviously some of them more, much more than that, um, uh, are more likely to, to to get out of, of their hobby. Commercial beekeepers are, are you know, going to have a harder time of being, being economically sustainable and viable. So it's really represent hardship for beekeepers to you know, fill in their contracts and their, you know, their, the pollination demand, which keeps increasing year to year. Um, so this is really um, uh, what, what this loss rate represents. And uh, one thing that I want to point out too is uh, we know honeybees are, are not native to the United States, uh, but in a way, you know, even though they are, their biology is so different than the native bees, and, and we, can't, we definitely cannot use honeybees as a representative of all the other pollinators out there, uh, it is still very interesting to, to see that this species, which is, um, you know, so flexible, <laughs> So, you know, she can, the honeybees can live in so many different environments and they're, you know, they're, they're getting taken care of by beekeepers that will be there to try to feed them, try to reduce their parasites rates, try to take care of them. And despite all of those efforts, we see those high turnover rates. So I think it tells us a lot about our environment and the, the difficulty to keep things alive um, in, in our, in our, you know, in our ecosystems nowadays that this, this species, which is specifically uh, flexible and cared for, uh, and we're still seeing those high, those high uh, mortality rates year after year. So even though it's not a direct representation of, of the mortality rates that we can expect in other uh, uh, species of bees and pollinators in general, uh, it goes hand in hand with just the general diversity issues, right? So, um, and might tell us a lot about the quality of our environment. You said it all. Okay, Natalie, thank you very much for, for your time, for the work of BEEP, your work with the people there. Say hi to everybody, to me over there. Uh, looking forward to see more results and whatever you guys can dig from this data, please let me know. I'll be happy to share here in the channel. Yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for your help in sharing all of that good data with beekeepers. Thank you.